right. It's six o'clock. We're going to get this show on the road. Um, welcome to, uh, I don't even know what day it is. Let's see here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the July 27th Hadley School Committee for the Hadley Public Schools. Um, this is uh, a meeting that we have um, a fairly brief agenda today. Uh, and I, may I get a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Great. So um, looks like we don't have any public with us today, but what I wanted to frame was just that our, our brief agenda today is really to talk about the fields, um, a vacation time uh, rollover, and to vote on breakfast price, breakfast and lunch prices. And then we do have uh, a whole slate of meetings coming up, as one can imagine. Um, July, thir July 30th, this Thursday, we have our initial review of the reopening plans. And then in August, we have three scheduled meetings that are all about um, reopening district strategy goals um, and then our regular meeting. So I'm sure that August will all be all about reopening plans um, and movement forward. But today, a uh, slightly different direction for our meeting. So with that, um, I will open up the floor for public comment. Uh, is there any public comment tonight? Okay. Hadley Media. They are public meetings um, public involvement. So um, having them broadcast or at least made available, I know you make them available on YouTube, uh, at least recorded after the fact is, is very helpful. So um, having the YouTube link after the fact really does help us get the information out. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? Nope. Okay. Um, presentation and discussion items. We're going to start with the fields update. Chris, it's all you. So, um, field work started last week. Um, <laughs> we were two hours into the project when I got a phone call saying, you already have a problem. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> that did not really bode well, um, but... We, um, we, we think we have some solutions. We'll know, I guess, after the meeting tonight um, on if we have those solutions. And we have also uh, met some challenges already in terms of things we need to add to the project. So um, those are also other agenda items that we'll have to address tonight. Um, but other than that, they're just um, piling up. You know, They're kind of scraping the loam off the top and piling it up. Uh, they will then be sifting it to get any rocks and all the grass, you know, the existing grass that's mixed in, get all that out, and then they'll be reusing it for the fields. Um, next up will be the irrigation systems. And um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying, but then they'll cover it up and plant the grass and we'll call it a day. So th there's oh, the... I wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> And there's there's culvert work by the uh, by the waterway down there where the water is draining towards right so they'll be replacing that. Yeah, I mean there there's going to be some work along that just to kind of make sure that the water drains correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first agenda item that they have, Chris, is the um, to entertain a motion to approve a change order of estimated twenty thousand dollars to the fields renovation project for the repair of the well. Could you provide some background on that? Yes, so um, we were told by the person that had put in the existing well there that the well was fine and um, he would be able to give us the amount of water pressure needed. Um, in speaking with the contractor for both, you know, the general contractor and also the um, subcontractor who's doing the irrigation system, we were told that they did not feel comfortable using the existing well and that um, basically the, the pipe coming out of the ground is, I think it's an inch and a half pipe, and they need at least a three inch pipe in order to give us the water pressure needed. Otherwise, you know, the irrigation system as it is planned won't have sufficient pressure and what we'll end up doing is we'll have love water coming out but not squirting out far enough basically to have that overlap that you need um, to have full coverage. So um, I had been working with Jeff on 
trying to make sure that this well would be good. Apparently there was a little misunderstanding with the well contractor that Jeff was talking with. He was the person that had put in the original well. And, um, and we were told that you could just add on a uh, stronger pump and that we could get sufficient pressure. Um, last week when Jeff spoke with him again, I'm sorry, my cat's meowing like crazy and driving me bananas here walking back and forth. Um, Dinner. <laughs> He um, he was told that we we not only needed to do the pump, but also add on almost an additional well, um, and that that would help to ensure that we had sufficient pressure. Um, Jeff was kind of taken aback by that because the amount thrown out for that was about fifteen thousand um, dollars, and he did not remember hearing that dollar amount at all or the additional well. So. In speaking with the with the um, contractor for the irrigation, they just said we really would just be better off drilling a whole new well, getting the proper size pipe out rather than you know trying to more or less band aid it with a bigger pump. Um, it would still be going through a small pipe. Um, so somebody was supposed to come out today and take a look at the situation and and be able to give us some kind of um, estimate as to what it might cost us, um, but the plus or minus $20,000 figure was was thrown about as a potential cost. I don't have an estimate from him yet, um, but that's that's what was said to me the other day. So uh, with that being said, I mean, it, it really doesn't leave us a heck of a lot of choice, but nevertheless, um, you know, with, with an addition as big as that, we obviously wanted to run it by you guys, so. Uh, well, and Chris, we should talk about too what we have in the budget already, right? What we've yeah, yeah we um we have all oh, about thirty five thousand dollars in the budget remaining, um, and we haven't gotten that check yet from um, Steve Lewis Subaru either. So, um, and we do have the money to pay for it. That's not the problem. It's just you know, anytime you get a twenty thousand dollar addition, it's it's not exactly something to cheer about. So. Um, but like I said, really not much of a choice there. So it's over budget, but we do have funding sources for, for this potentially. Well, no, we it's do. not. Is it technically over budget? Isn't it part of our contingency? No, yes. no, not, not the well. No. Why not? In terms of we have the contingency funds for, we are not technically over budget. We're not having to take funds from another source. So we're not correct. Over budget. Yes. We yeah. have contingency, not that's what I meant by we had $40,000, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. not in the original work specifications, but right. we have the funding for it. We are not we over it in the red. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And this is all staying within um, funding for the fields, not pulling anything from district operational funds or our approved budget. That's correct. Okay. Do you, want to do, do you want to do the action items? I was going to say. Yeah, is there a motion to approve this change order? Um, of an I just have a quick question. Um, okay. the, so we're not over budget and we are utilizing contingency funding we had set aside for this specific project. So we're not taking anything away from any anything else. But we did set aside this funding in case something like this happened. That's correct. Yeah, we had uh, the, the bid came in and it, I'm going to be rounding it, but at about six hundred and seventy thousand dollars, and we had about seven hundred and twelve in total funds. So that difference was basically the uh, contingency. So it was around thirty-two thousand dollars. Great. And so at this point, in an ideal world, there are no other sort of like new things. And, and of course, things like this happen, right? You it the uh, it always takes longer. It always costs more. You know, just this is the world of construction and, and excavation, but let's, let's just, so we just, now we hope that this is it. And from here till the finish line, there won't be. <laughs> Except for the next agenda item. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have, a, I mean, in fact, I, I have another change order here uh, for some trimming of trees uh, along the um, one side of the field that are hanging over the field. And, and that one's, that one's smaller, um, you know, so there are always going to be minor change orders, um, but that, that's a big one, so. Okay. We Great. certainly, Humera, don't, we certainly hope that um, there isn't as significant a change order as this one. Right. And right, absolutely. Right. right, Great. 
Um, I would love to make a motion to um, to draw um, the funds needed to support this unexpected uh, $20,000 expense, I think it is. Well, yeah, I mean, again, and that, that was just a, a quick estimate. We don't actually have a quote or anything. That's why I said around $20,000. Great. You know, is that a sufficient motion? So it's a motion to approve a change order of estimated up to $20,000, around $20,000 $20, to the field's renovation for the repair of well. That's I, I think we really should keep it of, you know, the funds required to do the well. That way, if it comes in at $22,000, we are not calling an, an emergency meeting to get the other 2000 or something, you know? Yeah. I would second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then the next item. Um, or is that the um, a butter? Yes. I, I, Sorry. Okay. So, yes. and this this was the two hours in we had a um, a, a problem. So there is an abutter on the I guess we call it the west side of the field um, that had planted crops in that area year after year. Um, they leased it from the town. And, and David Nixon and I, you know, discussed this at great length. We were trying to find the lease and, um, you know, try to find how payment was made. I ended up speaking with the abutter and he told me that it was, there is no written lease. It was just a handshake agreement that was done. And, and for years they planted there. And then, um, you know, I, I told David, you can stop looking for this lease now because, it's, you know, we don't have one. And I guess every November after all the crops were harvested, he would pay the town, um, you know, a certain amount of money. David wasn't sure what that amount was. Um, but uh, so what happened was he planted the crops this year. And then when the contractors kind of went to set up all the snow fence around the project, they saw that there were crops coming into the area that they were going to need to be digging. So, you know, they, they, called me and and I spoke with Ann and then I spoke with David and we had this whole <laughs> numerous discussions about this. And um, then I did speak with the farmer and I asked him for a number of items. Um, first being what is planted there. Second being what are the timelines for harvest. And third, what is the estimated value of what you have planted there. Um, and so some of the vegetables are already uh, harvested um there are still i'm trying to think of what it is here uh, seedless watermelon and cantaloupe planted and those would be harvested um probably within the next week now because a week ago he told me two weeks so i would think that would be a week from now then the um tomatoes and peppers would be harvested anytime between now and the first frost and, and so I, I told him right off the bat that we obviously couldn't give him until the first frost. It just, that, that cannot happen. I did reach out to the contractors and ask them, can you just save this side of the field till later? And apparently they can't just because of the way the designs are done and the drainage is specked out. They have to actually start right at that area. So they had several days more of scraping all the loam off. And so they could put this off for a while. But um, by next week, they said they really needed to be able to go in there. So in speaking with David, <clears throat> excuse me, and then with Ann afterwards, uh, David suggested that we actually just purchase the value of the crops um, from the farmer just to uh, kind of honor the uh, lease agreement uh, that, um, that he had with the town. Um, the remaining crops after I take out the um, Cantaloupe and watermelon are around $6,000. Again, it's hard to get an exact amount because he's actually going to be able to, I know that we're picking tomatoes and peppers in our garden. So I assume he will be able to harvest some of them last week and going into this week. So he'll get some value out of it. Um, so I, I don't have an exact dollar amount, but it'll still probably be somewhere around $6,000. And so that was the other item that we were asking um, your opinion on whether or not we should do that. And if so, approval to do it. Um, there's one thing I would probably mention is that we, we, we would probably want to use some other funds than athletic field funds, I would think for this. Um, just because, you know, it's, 
it's it's just that if you gave a donation for the athletic fields, you'd hate to hear where you're done, you know, that your donation went to something, you know, else other than the fields or something like that. So I would recommend that we, you know, perhaps utilize school choice or some other funds for this. So I have a question. Um, sure. Did the leaser pay the town for use of that land this year? And is it something that the town could refund to cover the loss of crops on town land? Um, he did not pay the town yet. He pays in November after the season, not not for the next season. Um, I could certainly ask David that whatever the town gets paid would come back to the schools, considering we're, you know, we're paying for for that certain portion. I mean, it seems like we had this project understanding that was land that we could develop. And unfortunately, I, I, I feel for them there. I don't want anybody to be out of pocket losing crops that they had assumed, you know, they could, they could plant. But if they're paying for use of that land, it seems like the two should kind of offset somewhat. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, I can run that by him. I think that's a good point, Heather. We, Chris and I had talked about that, about um, the other, you know, sort of questioning how did this happen? Because the, the farmer did know not to plant the southern portion, uh, but it's the western portion which isn't as clear uh, as you look at the process. So if you're, how do you say, if you're on, in the parking lot looking south towards the mountain range, those crops right in front of you were not planted because you knew we were going to do them, but it, it's to your, it would be to your right. Um, there's this strip that's surprisingly large, actually, and if you're out there and you go and you stand in the parking lot, there's some wooden stakes with flags on them that demarcate out what they're doing and it's quite significant. So you can see that it just was unexpected how big the project's actually gonna be. Um, so I, I support this to, to make sure it's fair. I, I, maybe it's a lesson learned. We could have been better in, in writing down the plan for this year. And I know we've been telling the farmer for years that this was gonna happen. And so maybe there was a bit of um, crying wolf, right now we actually mean it. Uh, so. I think we bear some of that responsibility, maybe for not putting this in writing in sufficient time. Um, so, and especially if we can get some compensation back from the town, you know, if the farmer, assuming the farmer is going to pay the town something. Sure. That se yeah. seems like a fair deal. So I have a question. Uh, we are talking about purchasing uh, the value of the crops, or in other words, we are talking about purchasing the crops. And we are a food purchaser. We purchase a lot of food on behalf of the schools for uh, feeding people breakfast and lunch. Uh, and, um, and actually that continues through the summer. I know Diane Zach does a lot of purchasing of produce from local farmers uh, to the greatest extent possible. So I would say that if we're, you know, so long as some of those crops aren't tobacco, uh, that we should be utilizing, not just, you know, paying, paying off, but also uh, receiving um, produce that in a way that we're able to manage it, that that would be the um, um, most collaborative way to sort this out between neighbors. I can certainly, oh, I'm sorry, I can ask him, uh, you know, one of the problems uh, in doing that is that there will be some crops picked, um, but most of the plants, unfortunately, before the season is done, will be just, you know, basically plowed over. Um, so, you know, he won't get the full amount of, of what he planted, but I can certainly see if, uh, if there can be something done um, I'll have to coordinate that with Diane Zach as well, because this is kind of a, a perishable item, but she is serving meals throughout the summer. So, you know, we, we may be able to use them. Sure. Chris, Chris can I also ask, is there a way, um, instead of doing two separate transactions to kind of figure out what this, this farmer yeah. would end up paying in November and just, instead of saying it's six grand, subtracting what he would end up probably paying or estimated his payment instead of doing two transactions, just doing it once. And yeah, I don't know if that's something that can be done. Sure. I'm just writing this down. Uh, yeah, I can ask that as well. 
That's a good point. idea. Okay. Yep. Okay, so given um, kind of the follow-up on these items, uh, do we need a motion to approve a change order for this, or can we agree that we're going to explore what the options are? Um, I basically need an answer tonight. Um, they, th here's, here's the thing. They want me to send him basically a letter saying that all his crops need to be removed by next Monday. Um, they need this so that they can keep going as planned. I'd really hate to send him that letter with the knowledge that we're trying to work out something financially, but I really can't say anything, you know, and that's, that's because uh, then uh, you, you really send that, you know, kind of pretty cold letter um, saying that, that it's all going to go by next week. And if there is some kind of, you know, financial compensation we can work out with him, it would be pretty good as far as a, uh, a PR standpoint to have that submitted with the letter. So can we prove, can, can we put forth a motion, motion, motion to um, purchase uh, crops valued at no more than, I think I heard $7,000 um, with the ability to um, salvage uh, and harvest whatever is salvageable and use it towards uh, food, um, our, our own food services. Uh, and um, minimizing the number of transactions um, to one, if at all possible. I would support that. Is there a second? Chris, I thought the number was six. Does it matter? Six, seven? It, um, it, it was six, actually, yes. Okay, so I, I amend that motion to six. Yeah. Six, seven. Okay. I mean, if you wanted flexibility, I don't know. It was six a hard number given from the farmer? Or? No, it, it wasn't a hard number. But it, again, because he's able to harvest some of the things out of there, I would actually look for the net of this is what you gave me for a value, but you were able to harvest just, I'm just going to throw something out like, well, you got 10 bushels of tomatoes and, and this much of peppers, you know, so that should kind of be subtracted off the value of what we give you. Yeah. Um, so it, it's going to have to kind of be a little bit of a back and forth where, he gives me the net value and then and I say, okay, you know, we can do that. Okay. I second that motion. All in favor. Aye. 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 Hey, Chris, can I ask, like, I, I know you mentioned like this shouldn't necessarily come out of like the athletic fields fund. Is there a recommendation of like where that money would come from? Yeah, I would, I would probably um, take it out of the school choice account. We have used that in account uh, account in the past to pay for, I mean, for example, the, the purchase of this land, I think, way back when, um, you know, various building type of projects. So, I mean, it fits into what we've used the, the funds for. And again, it's it's just one of those things that you really hate to use money donated for the field. So, right. No, totally. So uh, that brings something up. Is this is this the land that we had to purchase after the fact? No, no. Okay. This is uh, this is that's at the far corner of the field from it, actually. Got it. Different about her. Yeah. So I assume, Chris, then that, you know, you're working closely with David Nixon and the future administrator will know when once this lease is paid in the fall that it does still need to be paid, even though they weren't able to utilize all of the land because they were compensated for what was unable to be utilized. I'll probably reach out to the butter with David. Um, you know, we, we can maybe even set up just a conference call so that we're all on the same page. Um, and, and that way, you know, we can see how much he pays. And if, it, if it's going to be netted out of what we pay him, then we won't even have to worry about the November payment, you know, but that way David's on board as well. So. Um. Okay. Do you, do you have what you need for that item then? Um, I, I do. Was it all, was it voted on? I, it's the, yes. yes. Okay, yes. it was. All right. Yeah, that's fine then. Thank you. So then the third action item we have is um, around allowing a school committee liaison to the fields project. This, in this case, this is Paul, uh, to approve change orders in accordance with bid documents uh, with the understanding that all change orders will be reported to the entire committee at the, whatever our next regular meeting would be so that he is able to um, 
have the authority to approve these things as they are needed in this uh, construction environment. And then we would report back. So in this case, this is the first like change that we ran into. So we had to call a meeting because we want to keep everybody apprised of things and keep everything very public. We would still report everything. But if one school committee member who's familiar with the project could say, yes, this is in alignment with it so we can move forward and then report at the regular meeting, that would be helpful. So it probably should be bounded by uh, the funds we have available for the fields, right? It's not like I can spend, we're authorized to spend other funds. Yeah, well, I mean, if you just want to reach into your checkbook, Paul, you can do whatever you'd sure. like. Sure, <laughs> let's do it. Right. Buy some wells, buy some other stuff. Exactly. Paul's going to add a water slide. Oh, <laughs> exactly. nice. Good idea. So um, motion. Yes. I just have a question, actually. If it's something that's large, though, if it's something that's the change order of up to $20,000, I know that, you know, it'd be great to not have to call an emergency meeting, but yeah. could we at least get an FYI email? So if something yeah. big happening, we're not waiting, you know, 29 more days, Absolutely. you know, if it comes up. Absolutely. And I think that in accordance, I mean, certainly if Paul thought, whoa, this is, you know, we're going to talk about this as an entire committee. So we would definitely email and inform um, it was just, for example, something like this. I'm, I'm grateful to have the first kind of public conversation. I think that's really important. I don't know, something just leapt off my roof. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what that was. It wasn't, it was like an animal. It wasn't <laughs> anybody walking on it. Uh, but uh, so we want to keep this uh, public. But like in this case, if we hadn't gotten a meeting together and, and we've got to do something in yeah. you know, three days or five days. So motion to approve Paul's ability to um, approve change orders um, within the budgeted amount, mm -hmm. uh, giving us FYIs uh, uh, as, as possible um, and updating us at that next school committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Seconded. Second. 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 Oh, sorry, all in favor. Aye. 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 I'll, I'll probably abstain, right, as appropriate. No, you can you can vote for yourself. I can vote on myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, next, we have. Uh, I think we're ready to move on to the rollover of vacation. Yeah. So our twelve-month employees. I probably don't have to explain this to you too much. Our twelve-month employees found it uh, rather difficult to uh, utilize their time during COVID. Extremely difficult. For example, David Olson, our tech person, there was no way that he was taking any time. And all of our 12-month employees, so those are your 12-month um, contracted employees, not so uh, special education director, uh, myself, David Olson, and the two building principals. What the rollover would allow for, and I have rollover language that uh, if you agree to this conceptually, it's been put together by the Dupre Law Office. Essentially, it allows those employees to roll that vacation over just for what this one year, it's a one-time event. And if they don't use it, then as a one-time, it can turn into sick time. Sick time does not create a financial liability for the town. Sick time, especially in times of COVID, most of those employees are relatively new. They don't have a lot of sick time uh, on the books. David, well, April does, because she came as a teacher, but um, Pam and Jen are still relatively new employees. Um, so that's what the rollover request is. It would be one year the employee would have the option if right at the start they might say, there's no way I already have vacation time. There's no way I'm going to use it. Just put it in my sick bank or they can see what happens and what they don't use goes to their sick bank. And that would be a one-time event. Yeah, my, my thoughts on this one, you know, I mean, I think people are doing everything that they can right now to make sure that we are, you know, have everything lined up, uh, plans in place, what we know now. And I see this as, you know, helping them to understand it is important to use vacation time. It is important for your own mental clarity to take a step away and use time off. Paul and I had this discussion a while back. <laughs> And even um, in this environment where it might mean that you're not actually going anywhere or you're doing a day trip or, you know, it's not the vacation that you had planned. Um, but I also understand where some people, they're unable to do that. And because of their, 
dedication and devotion to wanting to get everything up and running by this end date that we have, this start date. Um, and I also understand that it's hard for um, folks right now to even think about taking a vacation. So I think that this is a nice gesture. I wish, honestly, more employers would do it um, because it, I think, uh, acknowledges that this year has is not been the status quo. It is not the norm. And to, you know, use it or lose it in 2020, it's like uh, so many people are going to just lose it. So I, I'm in favor of this. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear what the financial impact, you know, in, in terms of minimizing that the ability to roll it into the sick bank um, as needed in the future. I think that's, that's helpful. Yeah, I agree with everything you said, Heather. I think it's, I think it's important. I, 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 um, I love, I like the fact that it's one year and um, I would uh, urge our colleagues to use it um, at their, whenever they can to, it, it is important to, um, to step away in order to gain perspective and um, bring that refreshed perspective back to work. And I will have you know that, um, which I will get there for good reason, I'm not there, but every single uh, one of the administrators uh, included in this, except for uh, me at this point, but I'll get there, have actually, uh, they are doing that. Um, so, so yes, they are. Great. Uh, so do we need to motion on this? Yeah, we need a motion to approve a one-time vacation rollover um, or a conversion to sick time for 12 months administrators due to COVID. So moved. There a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, and finally, um, we need to set breakfast and lunch prices, which we have done at prior meetings. Um, it looks like the there is a recommendation to increase uh, the breakfast and lunch prices from uh, three dollars up to three ten for lunch, and from a buck seventy five to a dollar eighty five for breakfast. Um, that is the increase from uh, for this coming fiscal year as, as compared to the past fiscal year. Now I'm trying to remember the last time we increased it was. It, it was at least a year ago, if not two, because we did have discussions around um, making sure that we weren't out pricing our, our families, making sure that we, because we are so used to seeing the lunch uh, account where it is every month in those uh, financial reports that we weren't um, making you know, the situation any worse. But we also had to recognize that the price of food has increased. Can we um, can we comment on what the rate of the increase is relative to the previous increase? Chris, do you know that? You're muted, Chris. Sorry. Um, I believe the lunch went up a dime and the breakfast went up a nickel last time we, we did it, which I believe was two years ago. And this time it's uh, 10 and 10. That's 10 correct, yes. If, if I can just fill you in about this quickly. Um, so Diane is filling out paperwork uh, basically to the federal government with all kinds of information about her lunch program. Part of it is the um, amount that we will be charging next year. Um, the guidelines set by the federal government for lunch prices are that she's supposed to be, our, what we charge is supposed to be equal to what she receives for free lunch which right now is $3 and 48 cents. Um, so obviously we're way below that. They do give a nickel leeway. So we could actually be anywhere between 343 and 353. Um, we both thought that with the current situation, um, you know, certainly going up to, you know, that much of an increase was just not going to happen no matter what. And um, that any, one who were to audit the food services program would certainly have that understanding as well. Um, but we thought we might at least try to make some kind of progress. So, you know, again, in case of an audit, we could say, well, you know, look at the situation we're in. We're not going to increase the price by, um, you know, what, what is it, um, 43 cents, you know, per meal. 
Um, we're, we're moving toward that goal, but we're not going to get there this year. Um, all of which could be moot because in all honesty, they are looking to file legislation that would keep the lunches free for FY21. So um, they're free through the summer. And I believe it was filed just the other day to try to get that to go through the whole year, in which case nobody will pay anything and <laughs> that would be ideal. Um, but I, I also wanted to add that the $3 and 48 cent figure, um, because I'm on Ware School Committee, we just increased our lunch prices the other night too. Um, and they are in the same ballpark that we are. So they were nowhere near that $3.48. And to be honest, I, I don't know a district that is. Tell me, Chris, again, what's that three forty eight? That's what we get reimbursed for free lunches. And so they, what they basically say is, well, we're giving you $3.48 for these lunches. That should be what you're charging everyone. I see. Um, so you know, that, that's kind of where they are. But we, we just honestly didn't feel comfortable with an increase anywhere near that size. But is there a stipulation that we do? What would the audit uh, criteria be? I, I think the audit would, would just point out that, you know, you are below the threshold and you, sh you should be working to get up to that point. Do we have a sense of how much a dime per each meal would increase of revenue? Not. <laughs> I, I could probably find that out, but I, I mean, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. I guess here's what I'm, I'm thinking is just, is this a significant increase? And during these times, is it even worth the increase? And, and, uh, well, I mean, let, let me just, and I can do some incredibly rough math here. So, you know, by no means hold me to this. Because we're just, always at a deficit. And so does it really, I'm, I guess I'm sort of saying, is it, how much is this going to close that deficit? Yeah, I mean, just say, um, for example, that with the number of kids we have, just say we serve 500 meals a day, right? Times 180 days times 10 cents, it's $9,000. Um, so actually, the surprising amount, that's a little more than I expected. But again, that's, that's really rough math based, in fact, we know already we're not going to have 180 school days this year. So um, right. that's kind of out the window already. But again, it, you know, it would be in the, we'll call it seven to $9,000 range. I, I mean, I think that our, our prices have remained low. I, as much as I, I'm in favor of raising it, not too much, but, you know, but I also know that we may be faced with um, far fewer uh, folks having lunch um, this coming year, especially if the situation of what that lunch entails, if it is grab and go, if it is not a sit down, you know, in the cafe, you may have fewer people buying it. Um, but I think that this is just because they're, you know, if they're able to eat at home. Um, but I'm, I'm in favor of increasing it because I remember our conversation two years ago, it was kind of like, we are not, we are nowhere near what uh, the reimbursement was. So let's bring it up at least partly in line, but let's not, you know, we don't want families to be in shock about the increase. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that, that both Diane and I are very cognizant of, you know, first the financial situation, the entire country is in at this point in time, but also the fact that you always walk that fine line between, I mean, we're never profitable. So I, I won't say that, but between break even and the number of lunches that you'll serve. You know, we could charge enough to break even on these meals, but what would happen then is you'd end up, instead of serving, say, 500 meals a day, we'd serve 300 because some people would just walk away and say, you know what, it's getting too expensive to get my lunch at school, you know? And, and the end result is that the, the student would probably bring in their own lunch, but it would not be as nutritionally balanced as, say, the meal that's served in the uh, cafeteria. So we, we try to, you know, really walk that line as, as finely as we can. This doesn't impact um, reduced lunch fees for um, kids that are on reduced lunches when, when they go back to that. Does I it? don't believe so. I think it's just a flat amount that they pay and it's not a, a percentage of, uh, you know, what the lunch price is. So you need a motion. Uh, motion to approve uh, breakfast and lunch prices by uh, 10 cents uh, per meal uh, for the next uh, fiscal year. Is that a sufficient motion? Okay. Yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay. Um, great. We've done uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, action items, all of our presentation and discussion items. We have uh, four upcoming regular meeting dates that are on the books. Um, the only other topic I had for today, I wanted to uh, just compliment Hadley Media and um, all of the administration and students and staff who contributed to the Hopkins 2020 graduation video. Um, it came together and it looked awesome. So I really hope the seniors and their families are proud of it because uh, it, it was, <laughs> it, thank you. It was the closest thing that I think we could have gotten to being in that gym and having a live graduation and then some because you got to bring in um, uh, you know, the different speakers, the seeing all of the lists of awards, seeing the senior photos and their, their wills and, uh, it, you know, seeing just some of the action shots too. Uh, I just, I, I really enjoyed it. So I just want to congratulate everyone on it. It was very nicely done. Nice. That's great. I'm sure there will be more soon. All right. Is there anything else for today, folks? I wonder, um, so we have a marathon set of meetings coming up. Heather, does it make sense to just, um, I know there's a, um, a policy that governs public comment and there's going to be a lot of people who have uh, who, who may want to express their feelings. Um, does it make sense to recap or highlight some of that at this juncture? Sure. And then uh, if we can include it in the packet or um, if we want to lead off with that uh, in terms of opening our meeting and just reminding folks about that policy, uh, we do have a policy. And, it is, and it's hyperlinked into the notes that you have of that meeting under public comment. Yeah, yeah, policy separately. Yeah. Uh, BEDH is the actual policy in our district uh, policies. Um, and the takeaways are, um, of course, you know, we welcome public at all of our meetings. Uh, we are thrilled when we have public at our meetings. Uh, and we're just, you know, we're glad to have public involved and in, in contributing to the discussion. Um, the length uh, that speakers are allowed is three minutes to present their material. Um, however, we have uh, offered extensions for that with the committee's approval. Um, we do record that as part of the regular meeting. We don't tend to engage with speakers during that public comment, nor do we um, answer questions directly. Uh, it, it, we, we sometimes do, but there's not an expectation that we would engage um, during that public comment. Uh, However, we also, as we move through the agenda items and we, if we continue to have public on, which we hope that they don't just leave after public comment, uh, we do uh, allow audience members to ask clarifying questions during those sub subsequent deliberations on agenda items. So that's very helpful when we can answer things in the moment as we're discussing, clear up any um, you know, miscommunications we might have had or clear up any questions that might be lingering. Uh, obviously, improper conduct, remarks, um, personal comments about personnel, about specific people, um, th those are not allowed. Um, and if anybody does uh, continue with that, we, we will uh, cut off the public comment for that individual. Uh, but people have been very respectful of that in public comment. And uh, as the chair, uh, I will address and call on, I've tried to through Zoom, make sure that anyone who does wish to participate in public comment um, is able to raise their hand in the um, participants pane and then I can call on them uh, and make sure that everyone is recognized uh, that wishes to speak. And Heather, just so you know, in, in uh, anticipation of the large number of people attending that meeting, uh, Corey Veltovic will attend as an employee, so she will manage the chat for us and she can help with tracking those questions and making sure. So we're not trying to read the chat and participate in a meeting. She'll assist with that. That's very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Public comment so far has been 
primarily engaged in through discussion, through verbal discussion. We have made use of chat where we've needed to. Uh, most recently, Kumara shared a link um, with some public uh, who had asked about um, our, uh, I'm forgetting, what the anti-racism resolution, that's what it was, a link to that directly. And um, you were able to share that, Humera folks were able to uh, check that out right then because for whatever reason, the link in the packet was not, it was a PDF, it was scanned, it was not working. Uh, but otherwise, I have encouraged folks to not, um, not use the chat box, the typing chat as their public comment, but more to discuss, uh, air out what they want to discuss because that really is um, what we're looking for is being able to um, let folks speak to an item and then uh, have us consider that as we move forward. Great, thank you, Heather. Yeah, that no, was really helpful. Great, great suggestion, Humera. Do we wanna give just a quick, if folks are listening, uh, just an overview of what we're gonna cover or what they should prep for because there's been a lot of good work in prepping documents for that or where they can find them? Yeah, Annie, do you wanna cover that? What our sure. next four meetings are gonna be? Sure, so the, the decision, um, the school committee has the authority and the complete and total authority to approve the plan that is presented or not. And the school committee has the authority to make a recommendation at any time about how to proceed. So what will happen on Thursday is that the reopening team will present the plan the overall district plan. This plan has been available publicly since July 9th. So people have been able to watch as it's being developed and provide input to me and to other members of the team via email. Some people have called. So at that meeting on Thursday, it the purpose of that meeting is for the school committee to evaluate the extent to which the proposed plans are informed by the science around how you reduce risk when reopening schools. That's really what the school committee is attempting to evaluate. And to um, hear from the public and to um, consider uh, some of the input that families provided in the survey around reopening. And that's the primary purpose of that meeting. I think it's important for the public to understand that on Thursday, the school committee has the authority to do whatever they would like. But at this point, the plan is that the point of Thursday is not to vote on a final plan, is not to say this is what's going to happen for a return to school and make that decision on Thursday. It's just to evaluate the extent to which the plan takes into consideration what science is telling us about reducing risk when reopening schools. And then the following Thursday, the school committee would vote. That provides us with just roughly a week to make any changes the school committee recommends. And then that following Thursday, I would argue, um, and I'll restate this on this coming Thursday. So on August 6th, I would argue that if the, if the school committee is comfortable really leaning on science to inform what decision, and by that I also mean public health data, we make about what phase or what plan we're in, it would be very hard to say on August 6th, this is what is going to happen in September um, because the public health data could change. The school committee could say, if school were to open tomorrow, we're comfortable with these plans, if these metrics held as they are, we're comfortable with these plans to bring children into buildings. But I think it would be challenging on August 6th to say, we know what the data are going to be at the end of August, therefore we're going to say now what is happening um, the first week of September. The school committee, as you pointed out, meets August 24th for a very different purpose to talk about district strategy and again, for a regular business meeting on August 31st, I would say that on August 31st, school committee can reevaluate community transmission data and then say, all right, this is the plan that needs to be in place right now for students. Based on community transmission data, we should be in person, we should be remote, whatever that is. 
Um, but that's probably important for the public to understand. Um, uh, as, as, as much as we want to know, um, if you decide on August 6th what you're going to do five weeks out, a lot can change in terms of public health data in five weeks. Um, so that's just for the public to understand. That makes sense. And in that August 24th meeting is really serving um, in place of what we, we would traditionally have a retreat um, mm -hmm. that would be really dedicated time uh, to talk through the district strategy, vision, um, mm -hmm. superintendent goals. I think mm -hmm. we've done a lot of dialogue around that, especially most recently, Annie, with um, your superintendent review. Mm -hmm. so this is a dedicated, carved out time to talk through that. Um, but of course, that's as we're past retreats, this is public open meeting. Yes. Hey, Annie, on uh, yeah. July 30th or August 6th, will, it, will the reopening committee be coming with a recommendation? Um, yes, a recommendation that, yet, yeah, so I say that like, <laughs> yes, a recommendation that the biggest, the, the, I mean, spoiler alert, our big recommendation is. Uh, follow the data, follow the science. And the challenge in that is that it requires people to be really, really flexible. And that is not usually how schools run, right? It's much easier to say, we'd like to say we know what's going to happen month to month. So um, the recommendation will be, um, if we see these metrics, we think it's safe to do this, not just we, but the, the doctors we've talked to. But if these metrics don't hold, then we really should be doing this. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of a non-answer answer, but really that is the recommendation. And that is, it may sound really basic, but that is not what you're seeing in a lot of places. What you're seeing is a straw poll, pick a plan, that's what we're gonna do. And, and so on Thursday, are we starting with an overview of the plan? Yeah. 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 And the team will be there, uh, Jason Burns and Becky Jelinas, who are the president and vice president of the union, will be there to talk about um, some of the recommendations they made around adjustments to the remote learning plan, as well as survey data from a survey that they administered. The principals will be there to talk about the, the key differences in each school's plan. Cohorting at a high school is very different than cohorting at, a, at an elementary school. Um, and... Uh, the Dr. Mosler from the Board of Health will also be there. Um, she's had access to the plan the whole time, and I spoke to her over the weekend, so she'll be available as well to respond to questions. That's great. And can you remind us, ultimately, does the Board of Health have to approve our plan? No. No, the school committee. The school committee, um, I, I would say if, if Board of Health you know, if they were the ones probably at the end of the day, but it is not their authority, um, then it might be more folks saying, well, you have to wait for to determine, see where the data lead before you decide. But no, it's a school committee decision entirely. I, I just have to say, I find this especially interesting and it's sort of like a, uh, it's, it's a very intentional decision from the very top down to push the decision-making to the local level and to the elected officials, which, I just, I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, um, shoot, I lost my train of thought. It's gone. So, Annie, oh, so where, where, I'm sorry, where, where, can, where can people find the documents? Uh, the documents, I will send another updated reminder to folks and they are also i will make sure that the link is on the district website as well so i'll check that tomorrow as well and, and the, the packet it, will go out tomorrow or today uh, the pa i'm sorry the packet will go out tomorrow as well and the, that'll be posted and the link will be there so it's the same link that's always been there that people are following along with the plan but it'll be thank you uh, heather it'll also be included right uh in the agenda uh, within the agenda and on the district website, and I'll remind families as well. And do we have email. enough bandwidth in case we have hundreds of people that participate? I think I can get up to 500 on this, but I'll double check that. I'm just looking at the, what the Gazette said about the Northampton, and I know we're much smaller, but 
it also mentioned it was a six hour meeting. So uh, there you go, Ethan. There you go, Ethan. A marathon. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's what we're doing. So I will make sure that those links in an email tomorrow. Great. Anything else for tonight? We have a lot ahead of us. Yes. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night.